Hello and welcome to Dialogue. Democracy has long been revered around the world as a noble concept used to characterize a civilized society. But in the past years, this noble concept has somehow become weaponized, used to attack countries with different views from others. Just what does democracy mean today? Is democracy a one-size-fits-all, or should it be adaptable to the different circumstances of each country? Finally, how has China pursued its whole process people's democracy despite negative criticism from the West? With these questions in mind, I spoke with Peter Kawanja, President and Chief Executive of the Africa Policy Institute. That's our topic. I'm Xu Qinduo. Welcome to Dialogue, Professor Peter Kawanja. Uh, you know, democracy, we talk uh, about democracy, you know, every country has their own style, own characteristic uh, about the democracy, the practicing democracy, different systems. Well, ultimately, it's about like, the governance, whether there's good governance or poor governance, whether it delivers, whether it meets the expectation and demand of the people. Is that the way we should understand democracy? Uh, yes. One thing is that... Uh, Democracy was defined as the government of the people, by the people, and for the people. And therefore, it is the people that defines what democracy is. If they are happy, it is a democracy. If they are served very well, it's a democracy. It, the, the, the tendency in the world today is to weaponize democracy as an ideology to show which culture is more superior to the other. In the West, they say we are exporting democracy, um, like democracy is an orange or are oranges to be exported to other people, uh, which is not true. Mm -hmm. So that is weaponization of democracy for the purpose of demeaning others, for the, um, uh, for the purpose of uh, dominating others psychologically. The truth of the matter is that the world is not divided between democracy and autocrats. Uh, because when you look at China, for example, it has managed to lift about almost 800 million of its people out of poverty. Uh, whereas many, can, many of the, let's say, American, particularly the African Americans, who are my kid and kin, are still wallowing in poverty. So what, what, what would, who would you say is democratic? So democracy, it's true, is found in every culture. It is found in every civilization. The difference is the setting, the environment in which democracy thrives. In Africa, our democracy is guided by consensus. We sit at our tree, talk and talk until we agree, and then we move together. Here in China, it's guided by harmony, the harmony between the government the party, and the people. That's, that's what democracy uh, means here. In the US, it is about who wins and who loses. And so there must be an opposition. Even when it, is, it does not exist, you have to create one, because democracy without an opposition is not democracy. That's the way they think about things. There must be a duel between two combatants. Uh, yet it is possible to go the African way, which is talking until we agree which we call absolute consensus. Uh, and that was the ancient Greece a form of democracy. So democracy is ev in every human culture. The difference is how it is practiced and how it is used to benefit the people, its people. The, the big question that we've been debating here is about the difference between individual rights and the needs of the people. And usually, the material needs of the people prevail. You cannot have individual rights until you are able to satisfy the material needs of the people. And that's why one philosopher uh, said, development is freedom. If you want freedom, you better develop. If you want rights, you better develop. So the material needs trumps and democracy can never prevail in the conditions of poverty. Mm -hmm. So the first order question is to deal with poverty. And then you deal with the nitty gritties of whose individual rights are violated and who are not, which are not violated. 
A good point, of course, you know, on that uh, respect, of course, if you look at China's development, uh, that is, uh, you can say Chinese system is very effective, efficient, mm -hmm. and also it delivers, it meets the, the demand, the expectation of the people, the needs of the people, uh, in terms of material development and other aspects. Obviously, at the same time, which is very different from, let's say, U.S. style, uh, Western style democracy there. Western democracy is largely defined as liberal democracy. Liberal democracy itself uh, is rooted in Western culture. And Western culture has a adversarial relationship as the defining uh, characteristics. Adversarial uh, uh, as opposed to, uh, you know, harmony. Uh, and in that case, it is purely Western. Uh, when you come to uh, the countries, let's say, in Africa and in, in China, for, for example, it is a centralized democracy, where at the heart of that centralization is the people. And the people are the essence of everything in a democracy. And therefore, what we are doing here is that uh, in the new Cold War, uh, that is uh, between America against China, uh, what you have found, and I want to repeat that point, is the weaponization or turning of democracy and the concept of democracy as a weapon in the Cold War. Mm. And, and, and therefore, people, you have to look through, you cut through the thick of lies and misinformation and propaganda and see what es essentially democracy is about. Democracy is about putting food on the, on, on, on the table of the vast majority of your people. It is not where you have one uh, percent, again, is 99 percent in poverty. That cannot be a democracy. Uh, it is not about where people cannot access medical, medical services uh, and people are dying just because they have gotten sick. That is, that is not democracy. It is not where people are homeless. Uh, they don't have a shelter or roof over their head. That is not democracy. Uh, it is where people can access, access the basic rights. And those basic human rights are about food, shelter, clothing, education, health, and, the, and, and, what, and what have you. Uh, so the, the idea that you are exporting democracy to countries that have no democracy, and, and this is like a gospel, that is itself is modern imperialism. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, we, democracy used that way is, a, is part and parcel of the new culture of misinformation. From the latest news, you know, uh, U.S. Secretary of State uh, Antony Blinken, he was talking about this disinformation problem, especially in the time of artificial intelligence. I think it is a problem. I think that's the point that we can all agree upon, and in particular, probably the problem in the, of the U.S. Yes. Now, you, if, if you remember, we have entered a new era called uh, the post-truth era. Mm -hmm. the, sure. the post-truth era yeah. is about lies, misinformation and disinformation. And therefore, this is one time, if you remember, the British Prime Minister, uh, Winston Churchill, who said that uh, before the fact wakes up, uh, the lie have, I mean, have gone halfway around the world. Because it, it, lies, unfortunately, are sweet and liked. But fact is detested. Now, what we see happening today is that uh, with the lies of social media and the monopoly of the West, of a ma most uh, social media platforms, Facebook, Twitter, and so on, they monopolize the lies. They mo monopolize the tools of disinformation. And they, they also uh, uh, you know, uh, monopolize the tools of misinformation. Now, China has organized itself and gone to the traditional way of countering lies with facts but this time in a more powerful way. It is true what Rikken is saying, that China is telling its own story. The question is, who should tell China's story? Or is China supposed to keep quiet and listen to others telling its own story? So the Chinese have to tell the story. The question is whether they're misinforming or they're not misinforming. In my own judgment, they are not. What they are doing is to countering lies. Come to Africa, where I, where, where I hail from, and the Chinese come and build a nice railway that is helping people transport goods, move services from one corner to another cheaply. 
Then all of a sudden, you have this massive propaganda campaign which talk about the death trap. And you wonder, when they were building the transcontinental railway from New York to Los Angeles, mm -hmm. they borrowed the money. What are the Africans supposed to do? When they were building the Trans-Siberian railway, the, the, the Russians were building the Trans-Siberian railway, they borrowed money. What are Africans supposed to do? When we get money and build our own infrastructure, then the pools of misinformation and lies come in and dump that the death trap. And for the last five years, we have lived in a situation where, you know, any, any coin that comes from Beijing to assist the, the African brothers is seen as part of the debt, you know, debt burden. You're or talking debt about the, the railway from the, Nairobi. From and Nairobi to Mombasa, to Mombasa. And the one from Djibouti to Addis Ababa. Addis Ababa. Uh, all this infrastructure which is opening up Africa Beautiful to projects. the market. Yeah. It's wonderful. It's actually what you call global public goods, mm -hmm. literally helping the world to open up and reaching the world. Then somebody wanted the Africans poor because they are better off when you are poor, because you can exploit their resources. You can buy their uh, diamonds, their gold for a dime or for nothing. So the fact that the, these projects are liberating Africa, integrating it into the global market, then lies come in and falsify this and say it is debt burden. Yet 80% of the debt in, on the African continent is to the World Bank and the West. China has less than 20% of its debt. And much of it for the poor countries is cancelled. Every three years when we have some, I mean, a FOCAC summit, mm -hmm. in the G20 summit, you know, uh, China usually, uh, you know, cancels the debts of the poorest, the least developed countries. Now, the, the question is, what is happening here? That now China is speaking with one voice because it is a, it's a more coordinated machine in, some, in terms of doing its business. If you look at the harmony between the party and the government, the party and the people, uh, it's not what you find in other cultures. Uh, here now, you have communi Chinese communication network working them with the party, with the government, and with the people. That is why Brinken now starts to cry, because lies have no place. Right, you know, here said that China has increased, you know, billions of dollars uh, to increase its presence in Africa uh, in TV screens, for example, in media. Do African people or African nations think that's something a problem for, for Africans or for African-China relationship? By why is that a problem? You know, talk about it probably. That's, uh, you know, the, you know, he... I, I think one of the things we are trying to overcome in Africa and, and we are really struggling, is to convince the West that we are equal to them, that we are not grown-up babies, that we can think for ourselves, mm -hmm. that we can choose our friends, and we would have varied reasons to choose our friends and keep them. This is what Nelson Mandela used to tell them when they would go, when he would go to New York, and they start lecturing him about whether he should go to Cuba or he should go to Libya or such countries. And Nelson Mandela would not blink. He would tell them, you can go and jump into the swimming pool because you have no right to choose friends for us because we know who our friends are. Those who are with us during the struggle, Cuba, Libya, and others. I think this is the same thing we must say today that Africa has the capacity to choose its friends. Two, we have the capacity to know what is good for us. You don't need anybody else to tell you what is good for you. That is imperialism. Now, China has one thing going for it. In 1980, in Africa, which has 55 countries, only two were poorer than China. By 1980. 1980. Yeah, only two were poorer than China. Mm -hmm. The rest were richer than China. China. Today, China is, the world, is one of the world's greatest economies. And we are beginning to see a, a country that has created 500 
million of its people into a middle class, the largest middle class in human history and in one country. Uh, what does that mean? That the Chinese market is the market of choice. Of 140 countries globally uh, have China as its top market. So that means that Africa cannot sit back and begin and continue with its pro-West policies uh, brandly without looking at other examples that are going to help us pull our people out of poverty. There's no grudge against the West. There's no grudge against anybody. It is in our interest to pull our people or to lift our people out of poverty. And the best example you have today is that of China. And China has not done so by colonizing or oppressing any country. It has not done so by declaring war on any specific country. It has, for the last 40 years, I cannot recall where China was at war with any country. The inverse is true of other superpowers, that they thrive by basically unwishing violence and war against other countries. Whether it is within the coalition of the willing, the coalition of this, all these are coalitions of war. The world need a break. Mm -hmm. We need peace. We need harmony. And we need equality among nations. Uh, whether they are small or big, they need to be respected. I think that's what we, Africa is crying out for. We are, create, we are crying for global democracy. I know there is a lot of preaching about oh, how African countries should be democratized. Yes, as we democratize our countries, let us also democratize global governance. The U.S. Congress, they allocated money to sponsor, to support those media or individuals uh, which will do something to badmouth, to say the least, the BRI, Belt and Road Initiative. And yeah. that trap is the one of the uh, uh, good practice probably for them. And, and also if you look at the U.S. accusation, for example, against the Chinese companies, Huawei and others, there's no single shred of hard evidence of what the company has ever done wrong. But still, they are barred from the U.S. market, from some of the European market, and the Washington pressure. So this is a disinformation plus this is a, what do you call it, a geopolitical competition to slow yeah. down the Chinese development there. Yes, that, and, and, uh, and the good thing with the Americans is that when they declare the war, they declare it in writing. So those who lead the uh, American national security strategy of 20, uh, 2022, October, you, you recall that uh, this, is, this for them is a do or die uh, decade. Uh, according to the Biden administration, they have to do everything within their power to slow down China and, and cut its footprint in global politics. Therefore, uh, when they say that China is the only country in the world today that has the capacity, both economic, military, uh, intellectual, and otherwise, to basically go, um, um, lead the world, uh, they see China as a, as a real challenge. If you ask them, Russia is a power, but has no capacity to, be, to, to, of, to, to replace America as a leading power. Now, when you read those kind of documents and those kind of statements, then you are able to locate where uh, misinformation and disinformation are coming in, because you must badmouth a rival. But as you've rightly right put it, uh, I think China is not Iraq. Uh, China is not your Iran. Uh, China is not your uh, banana republic. It's, it's the world's second largest power in economic terms with world-class uh, military, world-class information architecture. At least over the last five years or so, China has managed to build a world-class information capacity that can counter uh, CNN, can counter BBC and other Western channels, even when they are combined. Do you think they are happy to see that? No, obviously, the, the truth of the matter is that uh, th this capacity is able to project China the way it wants to be projected. The problem is us in Africa, because we become now victims of this 
completely scratched by the West. And misinformation about China is rampant in Africa. I was, I was watching one of these uh, social media platforms in Kenya where they kind of did the, the deep fakes. Uh, you replace, you do photoshopping, and you replace an African roasting ma maize with a Chinese roasting maize in the same place. Basically, uh, say that, and then you say, the Chinese have taken over Africa. They are now roasting maize. And I asked, how many tons of maize combs do you have to roast to buy a ticket from Beijing to Nairobi? That's true. Uh, yeah, you, you know, the, some lies are so blatant. And so daring that you wonder whether people invest uh, intelligence in that. Because sometimes lies also have some intelligence, you know? Mm, yeah. So you don't have to tell blatant lies like that one. Uh, yet, you'll find it, you know, posted by very highly placed people to the point that uh, the ordinary person might think this is credible, that, uh, you know, a Chinese is in the streets of Nairobi mm -hmm. or in the streets of Rusaka uh, roasting maize. Yeah, which is exactly. which is not, which cannot even pay your rent right. uh, for in in Nairobi. So uh, Chinese capacity and architecture to broadcast and a kind of project its own image the way it wants to be projected is becoming a real threat to the West. To the West. And then, and therefore, my warning is, China must be prepared. Uh, it is on a rough patch because. The West will try to counter because image is everything. Uh, they say in English, give a dog a bad name and then hang it or kill it. Now, unfortunately for China, they are not able to give it a bad name as they would want. And that is what Brinken is complaining about. Yeah. He wish that he could paint uh, China black and then declare it uh, ready to, to hang. When it comes to the crisis like in Ukraine, in Gaza, of course in Ukraine, uh, the US and the West would love to see the global South or the global majority to be on their side to impose sanctions on Russia. But then when it comes to the Gaza crisis, mm -hmm. things are very different. Mm -hmm. You know, what, what, what conclusion do you draw or how do you characterize such behavior, such policies? That is, that's, that's double standards. It is basically hypocrisy in its worst form. Uh, and that's why in Africa, we, we started by saying that we don't I mean, appreciate the war uh, between uh, Russia and Ukraine as a principle. But we went ahead to say that you cannot now uh, you know, pull us to be part of the, pro the founder to your propaganda machines uh, against Russia. What we want to, to see is to see peace. And therefore, Africa organized itself into a peacemaking force. Uh, to mediate between uh, Ukraine and Russia. But you find that uh, the West is really goading uh, Ukraine to go on with the war until the last Ukrainian is dead. Then that, the, the time they will declare the war is over. Uh, and, and, and I think that's inhuman in itself. The truth of the matter is that uh, when you look at what is happening in Gaza and the killing that have been going off of innocent people in hospitals and so on, what emerges is a situation where the double standards are so glaring that you wonder whether people listen to themselves. If, because if you listen to yourself talking about Ukraine and you listen to yourself talking about Gaza, then you yourself can see the contradiction in your own words. And, and, and therefore, uh, it is important for, uh, for, for the West uh, to be truthful about things. And, and leadership, I must say, is about being credible. It's about being believed. It's about being trusted. That is what democracy is about. It's about a system that you can trust. And when you talk in double standards, you talk in hypocrisy, you convey misinformation about things that people can see, then the, the leadership begins to wear out and it's no longer believable. You know, when you uh, talk about uh, this uh, democracy, of course, transparency is very important. The free flow of information is important. But, but think about uh, Assange, think about uh, Mr. Snowden, you know, exiled or being imprisoned for telling the truth. What does that reveal about, uh, say, Blinken's love of truth or facts or information rather than, you know, or against disinformation? Is mm. that uh, 
you know. It, it's not true because it, it means that if lies, are, if lies are told about other people, you are comfortable and you are ready to literally, uh, you know, uh, even sponsor them or underwrite them. But if lies are told or if the truth is told about you, you don't want it, even by your own people. And therefore, this is a classic case of what we are calling the post-truth post order. And the sponsors of the post-truth order are going to punish those who tell the truth mm -hmm. and reward those who are going to tell lies on their behalf. And, and therefore, we are having a system of double standards, sponsored largely by the West. It is not about hard power. It's not about soft power. It's not about smart power. It's about sharp power. Sharp power. And sharp power is about lies, disinformation, misinformation, and literally going out of your way to live on lies and lies and lies. Well, lastly, you know, uh, this um, when you know viewers, readers, when the next time found negative stories from, say, accusations from the U.S. government or negative stories about China. What's your advice for them? No, no. They, I, I think I would have advice for China, because I'm familiar. Mm -hmm. uh, you're not going to. You're, you're, we're going to take time before we say we, we change the adversarial tendencies of Western culture. You're not going. We're not likely to, yeah. to change it. The only thing you can do is to strengthen your capacities to speak the truth. Uh, strengthen your architecture of of literally telling the, the truth about your relationships, about your relationship with Africa, about your relationship with Asia, about your relationship with Latin America. Your instruments of communication must be so strong that and, and committed to the truth that lies have no place. And until you overwhelm lies, the world cannot be safe. Uh, until you build enough jails and lock in uh, thieves, you cannot say that the villages or our communities are safe. Lies are the greatest danger to our civilization today. Misinformation and disinformation are the threat to our democracy today. And therefore, China has a moral responsibility to invest in instruments of truth instruments of communicating the truth so that the world can be safe. Thank you, Professor Peter Kawanya. Thank you for speaking with us. Thank you.